So thanks a lot, Patricia, for a nice introduction. And it's a pleasure for me to, to be here for the second edition, at least, of this uh, very popular course. I will talk to you about two different topics. Um, and I made a mistake and I included only the topic of the first topic in the in the title, but maybe that was a bit sexier than the other one, so uh, I don't mind. I will first talk about how we can use a uh, uh, whole Bayesian framework in general and, and priors to improve um, association results in genome-wide association scans, since I guess the audience is... Um, maybe let's just check who is awake in the audience. Can you raise your hands or make any uh virtual sign that if you know what genome-wide association studies are I do. very good so it looks a little bit more than half excellent um so um i will then not maybe spend too much time on this but um uh, but but if it's still there are some people who don't know, so I will I will explain a little bit the details of how genome-wide association scans are done and how we can improve them by using a relatively uh, smart Bayesian priors, and um, then we could have afterwards questions related to this topic, and then I move on to another topic which is related to that um, also on GWAS and how we can use GWAS for causal inference and how we can also improve causal inference uh, by using a, a Bayesian framework. Okay, and again, as, as Patricia said, please feel free to stop me. We are not that many. So uh, just any time you don't get something uh, or you have a question uh, or a comment, uh, please interrupt either directly talking the microphone or raise your hand. Probably if you raise your hand, I see that better or type in the chat any question. Okay, so um, I will, as I mentioned, we'll talk about genome-wide association studies basics, um, and then on how we can improve them by building priors. Uh, and finally, uh, I will basically show all this through an example of how we can tease out more of uh, longevity genetics, basically predicting how long you're going to live based on your genotypes. Um, so uh, standard uh, Genome-wide association models are looking at a phenotype. In this example, can you see my mouse moving? Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So you have a phenotype. Why, in this case, imagine uh, I often use this example of body mass index. So an obesity measure, which ranges between 20 and 25, is a normal uh, range. And you can see these are data from a, a local study in Lausanne. And these are actual BMI values of people in the court. In the, and the G represents a genotype vector. So um, you don't necessarily need to know the details. It's basically it's measuring certain whether somebody carries genetic variants or not and in how many copies, essentially. So you can have zero, one, or two copies of a certain allele. Um, we can have two copies, of course, because you have one metal and one paternal copy. So, for example, you look, look at the very long DNA sequence and there you are asking at this very position how many TLEs you carry. If you carry zero TLEs, the value will be zero. If you carry one, you got TLE only from one parent, then it will be one. If you have two, it means that you got a TLE from both parents. So that's genetic data. Uh, that's the phenotypic clinical data. And we are fitting a linear regression model uh, for continuous outcomes uh, where we can include covariates, as you can see here, um, such as uh, age, or sex, diet, physical activity, and so on. These variables contribute to the outcome. It is always a smart thing to include, as long as you know that these have probably a causal effect on the outcome and not a consequence. And uh, But these are just nuisance for us because these are well known from, from much larger epidemiological studies that have been conducted in the past decades. And what we are really interested in is whether which part of the genome, which genetic variations, which genetic markers are associated with the trait. And the regression slope or the coefficient is uh, in our field called effect size. So it's basically just the size of the strength of the effect. Uh, basically carrying an extra T allele, how much it changes your BMI by how many units. So if this beta is half, then it increases BMI by half a unit. If it's minus one, it means that having an extra T decreases BMI by one unit. You can also include random effects. Uh, of course, there's the, the general random error, which you're all very familiar with. 
but we can also include family memberships or people who share the same geographic region uh, or district or they went to the same school anything can be included here as a random effect uh, where you uh, define the structure very often in genetic association studies we include a random effect which is uh, has the variance covariance matrix of the kinship so basically this is a variable that reflects familiar relationships and of course you don't want to uh, to discover associations which are just based on sharing family because sharing family also means sharing environment so you want to regress those out as well so these are the four main components of the model where one is uh, a very simple error term with a diagonal error um, um, covariance structure. And here, this can be a more complex uh, uh, structure, covariance, variance covariance structure. And we have the two fixed effects. And the really interesting thing for us is this effect size. And what I will tell you about is how we can improve the estimation of this effect size in genome wide association studies. And of course, as you know from linear regression models, the most important parameter, the, well, at least for us, we get is this effect size, and we get a standard error estimate, and then we can also get a p-value from a linear regression. And if the p-value is significant, uh, then we are interested in the effect size. If the p-value is insignificant, of course, we get an effect size estimate, which is very broad and includes the zero, and um, and probably that's that's less meaningful. But still, it can inform you about the range of what kind of effect uh, can be plausible uh, given your data. Okay, so here is just a very simple example where uh, what we do is uh, look at the participants of a, a local Lausanne study and we group individuals according to how many TLEs they carry at a particular position. And that position is defined by this RS number. This is an identifier, unique identifier of single nucleotide polymorphisms. But just really imagine that you can always split the population. Uh, if you look at a particular genetic marker, most often into three groups and those who carry zero, one, or two TLEs in this case. And what I show on the y-axis y -axis on this plot is uh, that the different groups actually have different BMI distributions. You might even think that they have even slightly different variances. Or what's uh, more interesting for us in general is that they have different mean values. And that's exactly uh, when there's an association, if these mean values are significantly different, uh, in this case, in this study, in this sample of about 6,000 people, the estimate was around 0.7 units, which means it's every additional A allele increases your weight by about two kilograms, which when I translate the BMI units to kilograms, so it's a bit more digestible. Okay, so that's what we are after. And this is actually a real association. This is a, a SNP close to the gene uh, FTO. Actually, it's not impacting FTO. Uh, but uh, it impacts another gene nearby, but it's a minor detail. So uh, these are the typical associations what we're looking for. But if you look how large are standard errors, <clears throat> uh, then you can see that actually we can't reject the hypothesis that there is actually no effect whatsoever. So because of this, we need enormous sample sizes. So what people try to do is that how can we tease out more associations, how we can find more genetic associations is if you boost, of course, the sample size, you will get stronger p-values if the association is real and then that helps your discovery so it includes increased statistical power of course we can't change the size of the effects those are given but you can change of course if you have a cohort which has more environmental noise then the the residual error variance is, is decreased and that also increases power <clears throat> but what it proposes is that and many others have thought about it is that you can use other related traits to also improve power and that's exactly where the bayesian priors will be <clears throat> coming from using other related traits to boost the association strength of a focal trait, such as BMI. <clears throat> so this I is what- a, I have a question. Yes, go can ahead. Can ask a question? Can you maybe go back to the previous slide? Um, so here, the p-value is 0 0.08. And in the way you talk about it, you just said, okay, there is no, um, it's not significant as, as, if, as if it was, totally clear and unquestionable that a p-value of 0 0.08 is totally clear and unquestionable. And of course, we all know the traditional p-value cutoff is 0 0.05, but most of us also know that this is kind of an arbitrary, arbitrarily set um, mm -hmm. cutoff. Um, so I was just wondering, I mean, I, I understand that in a presentation like that, you need to keep things simple and um, 
will not go into the details of how we can you go we can go yeah, yeah. but it, i would i would find it really interesting in your work in your lab how you how you deal with this when you see something like that okay p equals 0 0.08 it's i mean it's it's not that large either then also question is this nominal p value or in this kind of um this is nominal what the, the adjusted p value do they play a role or not just a little bit more of context of p value and what you count as significant <laughs> and why these thresholds and okay no i've others. got another 50 slides on multiple testing correction maybe next time okay. i talk about that too <laughs> but uh, basically the here the 0 0.08 makes us un unexciting because we are testing a million markers in the genome. Mm. So if you test a million markers, you will get about 50,000 of them, which will be of a zero a p value of below 0 0.05, mm. um, even under the null when nothing is associated. So if we see something 0 0.08, the problem with it is that, of course, you can get excited about it, um, but then we would get excited about many tens of thousands of SNPs. And of course, there is no lab on Earth which would follow up that, OK, now let's CRISPR this one and then let's see what happens in the zebrafish or whatever. So these, uh, we, we, that's why we have to be very selective. And it's always a trade off between uh, if you want to control type on error rate, which we very obsessed about, which we basically don't want to just give away signals that are, 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 are I have, uh, we, we don't have too much confidence and there is a very high chance it's not going to be replicating. Um, and on the other hand, of course, that hinders us uh, to, to discover a lot. So, of course, if you make the p-value threshold milder, you will have more sort of claim discoveries or potential discoveries. There's always suggestively significant and significant and all these kind of terminologies, uh, which show that uh, the 0 0.05 is absolutely arbitrary. Uh, and indeed, you can play with these thresholds. You can play with different controls. Um, so you can control family-wise error rate. Then it will be very, very stringent since we do many, many tests. You can do uh, false discovery rate control, which is much milder. And that's much more interesting uh, for such efficient experiment as GWAS. The same thing happens if you just run, for example, gene expression levels and you associate with a trait. And then you see, let's say, people with cancer, without cancer, what's the differential gene expression? And again, you will get then 20,000 different p-values. And then where do you draw the threshold? Um, the, the idea is that if you propose, what, wherever you draw the threshold, and then you propose a set of now genes, or in this case, biogenetic markers, then uh, what fraction of them you expect to be true? Um, and, and that's what, we, with the false discovery rate, we can really exactly say. So if I use this threshold, then I expect probably 97% of my uh, proposed markers to be false. Uh, so people wouldn't really be very enthusiastic about taking them to, to full up experiments. But, but it's, a, it's a very important point that here I just made it arbitrarily to, to, uh, to just show you how horrible it is that uh, a million Swiss francs spent on a cohort and you can't even discover this, the most strongly associated SNP with BMI. Uh, in in a way which which is convincing. So this SNP itself in the genome it would rank uh, not even in the in the in the top five percent. Uh, so so but this is just to show that we need some smarter methods to to boost these associations uh, and and to better prioritize the very vari the variants that are associated with a given trait. So this SNP itself indeed it's a single variant. It's very frequent in population. So it's more than 30% frequent, and uh, it explains about a third of a percent of BMI variation. So it's still very, very small, but still people who are born with 2T allele versus 2A allele will give you about a four kilo weight difference, which is, of course, unfair. If you think about it, that at birth it's given. Thank you. Are there other questions? Good. Uh, so this is this what happens when we instead of six thousand people, uh, we look at hundred thousand, hundred thirty thousand people. Uh, finally, we get some association. So this is a Manhattan plot. This is really a nice and very simple summary of when you run genome wide. So you see here chromosomes from one to twenty two. We very rarely look at other chromosomes out of ignorance, to be honest. And in each chromosome, there are of course there are different physical position uh, of the different uh, genetic markers. 
And the y-axis position of these genetic markers tells you how strongly they are uh, linked to a trait. Um, it is the minus log and p-value of the association, but you can also think about it as really how much variance they explain. That the higher the tower, the higher the point is, the more variance they explain of a trait. And uh, this was uh, exactly Leonor's point, is um, that since we do a million tests, uh, there's the magical 0 0.05 threshold, what people are using, uh, and very stringently controlling family wise error rate uh, at 5%, meaning one of the, the means to do this is, is Bonferroni correction, where you take this threshold, you divide by the number of tests, which is about a million, and then you get a threshold of 5 times 10 to minus 8, which is the minus log ton of it is about 7.3, and that's where you see this black line. So anything which is that you see many, many gray points below this line, that's where um, we are not sure what's happening there, but we can't claim that this discoveries and anything which is above this line, we are pretty confident. And actually later studies looked at these and all 32, when we look now at 3 million people, uh, these are all super strongly replicating and it's very, very, uh, very strong, all these results. So basically the probability of even one of them is wrong is less than 5%. So that, that's that's quite convincing. But as you can see, it's it's quite ridiculous that we test the million and we only find 30. And and that 30 cumulatively not even explain more than about two, three percent of the uh, of the phenotypic variance. So uh it's it's a lot of fuss for not much, maybe seemingly. So it would be very nice uh to to try to boost and, and discover more uh without compromising type one error. So what we did so far is we just do one snip at a time test. But what we can do is try to estimate the effect of all SNPs simultaneously. So if we have the phenotype, again, imagine you can think about BMI here, and this G will be a matrix. Uh, it will have as many rows as and many individuals you have in a court and as many, co as many columns as many SNPs you have or genetic markers you have. So it's typically about a million column and several hundreds of thousands of rows. And these alphas, it's a vector. So it's as long as many markers you have, and it's an estimator is the effect size of, uh, what we want to estimate is the effect size for each SNP. So now the difference is to, to my previous slides that I showed you the equations is that now here we put all SNPs at the same time. Of course, you can't just throw this all in R because it will just blow up. It won't have enough memory. Um, for such a, such a big manipulations, we can't really easily do. And the second reason for it is that we have actually more variables than individuals. So this we cannot uh, uh, actually estimate very reliably. Uh, we, what we very often do, just to simplify calculations, that we standardize the phenotype that it has zero mean and unit variance. And we also standardize genotypes that they have zero mean and unit variance. And uh, plus we have, of course, the error term. But now the difference here is that this is basically the, we try to get the best linear unbiased estimator, essentially. So what we assume, instead of trying to really estimate every single parameter, we can ask something different. We can <clears throat> put a prior distribution on this on these alpha effects. So here we say that these alpha effects, uh, the, the SNP effects are coming from a normal distribution with a mean zero and, a, and some variance. Now this is very uh, biologically um, justifiable because actually when we see real data and then try to estimate these alpha effects, uh, at least we can estimate the tail of this distribution and, and that looks pretty much normal. And as, as we get bigger and bigger sample sizes, we can more and more accurately estimate really these effects in a fixed effect model. And, and it, it, it all looks pretty much either normal or a mixture of few normal distributions, uh, very rarely more than two normals to be honest. So, uh, so the advantage of this is that we have an assumption, a distribution assumption of this parameter. And instead of now trying to estimate each individual parameter value, which is would be uh, afterwards, you could estimate the posterior effect uh, of, of these values. Here, actually, what we can use this for is we, could, we use something which is called the empirical base, which we very often use in, in, in um, statistical human genetics, is where you your main aim is not that you, you put in a prior for this alpha with a fixed value of the variance, but actually let the data tell us what is the best value of variance that describes the data best. So if you look at the outcome variance covariance matrix, uh, then it can be written in a form which after some algebra, uh, which I will obviously skip here for the interest of time, 
uh, it decomposes into two components. One is the genetic kinship. So it tells you how genetically closely related two individuals are multiplied by the heritability of the trait. So the heritability is the total contribution. Basically, it's the variance of the genetic predictor uh, divided by the variance of the outcome, which was set to one. So it's basically really just the variance of the genetic predictor. Uh, and the second component is the remaining unexplained variance. So you can see here that really this term corresponds to the variance covariance matrix of the epsilon, which is the unexplained variance with a, with a diagonal error uh, structure, the uh, covariance covariance structure. So it decomposes into these two matrices, and there's the single parameter we, we want to estimate. The kinship can be estimated from the data because we have the genetic data, so we can calculate the kinship between any two pairs of individuals. Um, and it's it's a fairly simple thing to do. Even if the sample size is a few thousand, you can estimate this heritability uh, up to, for example, if you have 5,000 samples, it's roughly the standard error will be about 5%. And you can do it in, in various different ways. Either you do it uh, as a likelihood function maximization, where you have a single parameter here, you observe the phenotype, you observe the genetic similarity, and uh, this is the you want to maximize the likelihood function with respect to this uh, heritability parameter. You can also use Hasselman Elston regression, which is I always like to teach it because it's much more intuitive. Um, because it basically uh, looks at how different two individuals phenotypically, uh, so that that will be a phenotypic uh, dissimilarity, and you can regress it on the kinship itself. And sorry, there's a minus two times this missing from the slide, but the, the point is that uh, how phenotypic similarity uh, relates to genetic similarity is uh, basically you can do it with the regression and the regression slope, of course, is related to heritability. If the heritability is zero, then they are not related at all. So the slope should be zero. If they are super strongly heritable, then they're, this, the, the genetic kinships should be a good predictor of the phenotypic similarity. So imagine the extreme case when the trait is 100% heritable, then knowing your genotypes, you should be able to know the phenotypes. So if you have a perfect genetic similarity, you have an identical genetic profile, then you ha should have an identical phenotypic value. So this is where something where we can use this empirical base approach to estimate heritability of traits, which is very useful. You already when you have 30,000 samples for BMI, it gives some heritability of about 0.2%, uh, I'm sorry, 20%, 21%. And for another obesity-related trait, it's about basic base ratio adjusted for BMI, which is a body shape measure. Um, it's about 10%. Uh, these estimates, we shouldn't really, the, the people who are really obsessed with heritability and that there is one heritability value, the heritability changes with age, it changes with sex, it changes with social economic status, it changes uh, with the, the year of birth of a cohort you're looking at. So it's, it's, it changes by geographic regions. So this is uh, not just one single value, and, uh, but it can be highly variable. OK, so now uh, let's get back to the actual GWAS estimates uh, in, instead of globally estimating how much they contribute in total. And let's try to build some priors. How could we inform um, a trade? And why we come across what motivated us to, to do this work was when we looked at genetic association scans on life expectancy. And of course, how long you're going to live, you might argue that it's it's basically just down to the environment, what you do, how you live, whether you smoke or not, whether you drink or not, and uh, how much physical activity you do, how much coffee you drink, and so on and so forth. Of course, these are major contributing factors. Uh, twin studies suggest that still about 20 to 30% might be down to genetic factors. Uh, most probably, the narrow sense of really the additive heritability captured by gen common genetic markers is, is more than about 10%. This is also an interesting trait because it's also very much under assorted mating, which also inflates genetic heritability estimates. Um, because what's weird is that you tend to choose partners which tend to live the same age as you. And uh, of course, at the moment when you choose someone, you don't know how long that person will live, but still just the fact that the time you spend together, you share a lot of environment, it will make you uh, much more similar in terms of uh, environmental factors that uh, predispose to life expectancy. But even you are correlated even in terms of the genetics of life expectancy, which of course you can't know how it happens. But I will shed light why it really happens in, in a few slides. So, okay, it has some 
heritability, uh, certainly less than obesity or height or, 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 or diabetes, but, but still it's, it's decent. And genetic studies usually focused on extreme case control. So they looked at people who, who lived extremely long, over 90 years, and they, uh, people were hoped to find that there would be some magic genetic factors that make these people um, uh, live extremely long. Uh, often they show many of these extreme long-lived people who are smoking and drinking very heavily. And despite this, they, they have some solid genes and, and people were after these. Very quickly, what they identified, which is a very robust gene, is this APOE, which is uh, either multiple different independent genetic variants that contribute uh, to lifespan. And I will explain to you how very soon. And there have been other couple of other proposed genes and most of which we haven't really replicated. So when we looked at the UK Biobank data, at the early release was only about 120,000 people. Uh, first problem was that everybody was alive. So of course it's good for them, but it's bad for the scientists who want to do life, um, lifespan genetics. And But luckily they asked the participants how long their parents lived. So we can do something which is called like proxy GWAS, which means that instead of um, using your phenotype, you use the parents' phenotype. Actually, I don't like this explanation. I like much better to say that we use your genotype as a proxy for your parental genotypes. And then you are associating everything in the parents because that's where we have the phenotype, but we don't have the parental genotypes. And then we use your own genotype as a proxy. So it's, it's not bad because you have two parents. So you can have two different association scans. You can run one scan for your mothers. Um, and, and in the UK Biobank, since the participants are between 40 and 70 years of age, their parents or the fathers, at least three quarters of the fathers by now are dead and uh, more than half and between two thirds of the mothers are also dead. So we have very accurate estimate of, of really the lifespan of the, of the participants' parents. Uh, so the, the aim was, okay, it's, it's good if you have some genetic markers that we can identify new ones uh, and also test the old ones and to see what, um, what kind of mechanisms uh, through which the, these effects are exerted through. And then we did some also follow-up uh, study in mice. Okay, so now about the priors. How can we get good priors? So if I want to estimate the SNP effect on lifespan, uh, I can use other traits that help me. So I know, for example, that if a SNP predisposes me to, uh, to heart attack, could be a risk factor, are much more likely to die earlier. So that's a risk factor for uh, early lifespan, for short lifespan. And uh, I can use that GWAS study, so that association scan I can use because if I know the SNP effect on this risk factor, such as uh, a heart attack or uh, even type 2 diabetes shortening lifespan, uh, if you have generic coronary artery disease, it shortens lifespan. If you have high HDL levels, lipid levels, that also high cholesterol levels, that also shortens lifespan, and so on and so forth. So there are a couple of potential risk factors here, which we know very well, and there many studies have been done. So those studies already provide us estimates of these, the effects of those SNPs on the risk factors. And we have, uh, we could use external studies to estimate that, that estimated or the effect of certain uh, risk factors and disease on lifespan. Uh, that would give us this causal effect of those um, risk factors on lifespan. And then you can imagine the total effect of the SNP on lifespan should be if you just go through all the possible paths here and you sum them up the effects. So of course here we need multivariable causal effect estimates <clears> of <throat> the different risk factors. And uh, these are coming from the previous GWASs. So that's where the prior information is, is both here and here. And then our prior effect would be the sum of the beta times alpha. So the effect from SNP to risk factor then to risk factor to lifespan. Because let's imagine the SNP is increasing your BMI by two units. And each unit of BMI is decreasing your lifespan by five months. Then the total effect of the SNP would be the two units times five months. So it would be 10 months decrease for the SNP. Of course, uh, rest assured that there is no such thing which will increase your lifespan by 10 months. Well, the, the strongest one is actually, it's about eight months. Okay, so uh, that's how we get prior effects. And this is the advantage that we haven't used anything about our actual study ourselves. Uh, there is a, a caveat, and I, I'm not going to talk about it too much. How can we estimate these multivariable causal effects? It's through a method called mental randomization. 
uh, and I will tell you a little bit more about it in the uh, in my second slide deck. But just for the moment, imagine that this was estimated from some independent source. Okay, so we have these priors. Uh, what kind of uh, so just you might be curious what kind of risk factors impact lifespan? Probably you you aware well of. Uh, any guesses here? Just to try to engage the audience a bit more. What kind of risk, apart from the ones I told you, what kind of any environmental or disease risk factors do you think would shorten your lifespan that we should consider, which is genetic basis? Yes, exactly. Nutrition, very good physical activity. Absolutely, smoking is the biggest killer. Good, okay. Um, you captured, yes, air pollution is very good. Um, <clears throat> actually, uh, yes, so we, we didn't consider air pollution because uh, here we care about only risk factors that uh, but it's still a correct answer to my question. Uh, we, we care about risk factors that have uh, that are impacted by genetics, and air pollution is, of course, it depends on where you live and where you live. It has some small genetic basis. Maybe it's about two to five percent heritable where you live, uh, down to your genes. Uh, but it's it's not really a direct genetic effect. Um, yeah, writing grant proposals definitely shortens lifespan. I can I can assure you. Um, Exactly, stress. Um, the measure of stress is, is very difficult in cohorts. And, and also the other trace, the nutrition and physical activity, it, it seems like it's something super simple, but, uh, but people lie a lot about what they eat and how much physical activity they do. And I have another slide deck about this. It's super interesting to, uh, to compare the two when people wear actimeter devices so that we know exactly how much they move. But at the same time, we ask them, how much have you moved in the past two weeks? And the correlation between that is, is, is ridiculously low. So it's about 0.15, uh, meaning that you contrast what people say. And nutrition is, again, if you compare, uh, for example, sugar consumption, it's people who are the heaviest, they, they report to consume the least sugar. Uh, but that's mostly because how uh, your other traits impact um, your nutrition or how you wish you would change your nutrition. So it's, it's very difficult to assess. So many of these traits are difficult to assess, but a couple of them we can, and some others have very small genetic basis. And basically this is what happened when we uh, looked at a couple of traits. So we, we started off with about 60 traits, and then we narrowed it down to the few uh, that were significant and very robust. Uh, Unsurprisingly, of course, diabetes, having high triglyceride or high cholesterol levels, which are here. So here is the good cholesterol. Here's the bad cholesterol. Good cholesterol extends your lifespan and bad cholesterol decreases your lifespan far more than good cholesterol. That's good to you. BMI is also something uh, which roughly a, every kilo, every extra kilo you carry in your life, it decreases your lifespan by two months. Um, smoking, as was correctly guessed, is decreases, but quitting smoking, you gain back the years. Of course, here, the time component is very important and I can't make any guesses based on the data we have. We can't estimate really how quickly you have to quit to gain it back. Um, the best is not to start anyway. And then intensity, uh, this is smoking intensity. It adds an extra uh, minimum. So if a pack of cigarettes, uh, every pack of cigarette is roughly maybe 10 years minus. Good. What was interesting and unexpected is to, to see years of education. So it means that roughly every year you spend in education makes you live one year older, one, one year longer. Uh, yeah, there is a comment about, uh, a question about lying um, and memory. And uh, and uh, you can have good intention exactly. So I shouldn't call it lying. It's it's misreporting. So you actually have a very interesting project ongoing about reporting bias. Reporting bias also how much you misreport and how inaccurately you report. Um, the best predictor of misreporting is uh, is being male. So um, men are the worst study participants. They misreport the most, and the older you get, the most uh, misreport thing you do. 
uh, anyway, parenthesis closed. So uh, very good. So it means that we have a couple of traits which have um, uh, impact on lifespan, and many of these are are genetically um, have genetic basis. Uh, so we can use them to build these priors. So again, we get back to these priors. So we will just plug in here education, diabetes, obesity, and so on and so forth, and build these uh, priors. And then we can do a Bayesian scan. So what we will do is we get the GWAS estimate. So when you run a genome-wide association scan, for each SNP, you will get an estimate on the SNP effect on the outcome. And of course, the estimate will be coming from a normal distribution uh, with the uh, mean value of the true uh, uh, parameter and with some variance. And of course, the variance is usually going down as the sample size increases. Uh, now, the null model is that the, the true value is zero. So the SNP has absolutely no effect on the outcome. And we are just saying some random noise, basically, as the estimator for the effect size. Now, the alternative model is um, that it comes, the effect size, the true effect size, comes from a normal distribution. But now our mean value is the one that we uh, estimated. So these are the ones, the effect estimates of uh, of the SNP i, so the genetic variant i, on trait j. So imagine j, when j equals 1, it might be the effect on diabetes. When j equals 2, it could be the effect of education, and so on and so forth. And we sum it up for all the traits that we consider as causal uh, and that have a genetic basis. And of course, each effect that we estimate from g was needs to multiply by the causal effect of that trait on lifespan. And that gives us the that was our prior effect. So that 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 would be our prior, the mean for our prior. And then of course we have an uncertainty because these estimates are coming from actual studies. Uh, so it, they have their own variances. So we have actually in reality, this causal effect has also a variance. Uh, so in reality, it has three terms, uh, but this is the most dominant term. Okay, so we have. Um, of course, if these estimates are very imprecise, then this tau value will be very large. So we don't have much confidence about um, about our prior. So it's good. At least we pushed in as much as possible all information available uh, at hand. And then we looked at something called base factor. You probably heard it in the course, um, which tells you what's the probability of the data given your alternative model divided by the probability of the data given your null model. And in our case, these base vectors will be very, very simple. And essentially, the, the, this model has really few parameters. It's just basically param parameterized uh, in general by this theta, which in our case, it's um, it's really uh, this gamma. And the two different models have the two different uh, distributions. One is the, the fully zero, and the other one is a normal distributed variable. So it really simplifies this base vector to the ratio of two Gaussian uh, curves, two Gaussian uh, density functions, uh, one with the mean value, of course, of the prior, uh, where we simply we need to just sum up the original uncertainty about the estimate and the uncertainty about our prior estimate. And plus we have the null, which will be the mean value of zero, which will have simply the uncertainty of the estimator itself. So the ratio of these two, if this is large, it means that we believe that the model one is much more likely than the model zero. And that's when we are, we are of course, interested in and get excited about. Uh, more graphically, imagine here the null hypothesis is that you have a mean zero with some variance. And the alternative hypothesis is that we have this prior effect uh, with some error, uh, which is a bit larger than the, uh, the null error. And if we have an observed value, let's say it was two, the observed effect size. Uh, our prior was three. So you can see here that still the, uh, the model one density is much higher than the null model density. So the uh, density function, so the, the numerator will be this height of the, this red line and the denominator will be the height of this red line. So you can see that in this case, the base vector is probably somewhere around four. Okay, so it really compares that our observed value, of course, if your observed value and your prior completely coincides, that's where you have the best chance to get a, a really good ratio. And if it approaches zero, then you will be, your base factor will be very, very low. Great. So we have now some sort of 
quantity that tells us how much better uh, the observed data is fitting the alternative model that we derived. So we can run it uh, for every SNP. But now the problem is that, of course, if I give a huge prior, a very strong prior on, on, on some variants, maybe uh, just by chance, I will get a very huge base factor. So we need some sort of what happens under the null. And the way we, we, we shuffled it um, is that we imagine now that the, the priors are now distributed totally randomly in the genome. So we keep the prior distribution. So the prior effect distribution across the genome is kept as it was. It just now we randomly distributed to different SNPs, the priors. So we break this link between the prior effects, which were attributed to a particular SNP now, we give it to a random SNP. And then we see what kind of base factors do we get then genome-wide. And then we can repeat this experiment. We reshuffle again the priors, and we get new base factors. So we can do it. Uh, we did it in our paper about 1,000 times. So for each SNP, you would get 1,000 null base factors. So it's very good because we, we really now have a, a comparison of, of uh, are these base factors are really uh, important. Or, or, or unexpected compared to if you were just randomly throwing priors on the genome. Um, I will, in the interest of time, I think uh, I will skip this part, but we did basically a bit smarter way of, instead of a uh, permutation procedure, we can do uh, a very accurate estimation of these uh, base vectors under the null uh, with some algebraic trick, which I will skip for the moment. And um, I will just show you now what is the distribution of the base factors that we observe for the lifespan data. So you can see sometimes it's about even up to 3 million as a base factor is so much more likely, uh, the, the alternative model. And you can see that, of course, for the majority of the SNPs, the base factor is one. Uh, the null model or the, 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 the prior model is pretty much the same. Um, and, and of course, it happens also for a reason that very many of these priors are very close to zero because when we don't have much evidence that these SNPs are, are impacting uh, lifespan threatening uh, traits. And this is the uh, what we get under the null, the black line. So you can see if if we just randomly throw these priors in the genome, these are the distribution of we get for the base vectors. So we see a massive uh, excess of, of high base vectors compared to, so, so this is really something meaningful. And, and not just happening by chance to have such to observe such high base vectors. So the advantage is now that uh, what we do is, uh, of course, with these uh, null simulations that we get the null base vectors. We can also get p values because people are, of course, it's a Bayesian approach. But uh, in our field, people very, I mean, I mean, journal reviewers very much like to see p values, and of course, they want really to see a control type one error. Uh, so luckily, we can then turn these to p values. Um, and, and then you can see that we get back very similar effects. So basically, the initial G was identified only these uh, four hits. Actually, this one was not even identified in the origin G was. So basically, there were, uh, sorry, no, the initial G was when you do, don't use any priors, you will get essentially these two hits. And if you're lucky, depending on the sample size, you may get another one. Now, with the very same sample size, but using these informative priors, we get actually 16 hits. So we have a lot more um, at 5% at FDR level. Uh, but when we look at the actual hits, so you see FTO comes up, which you might remember from the obesity uh, study that was the top hit. Uh, all these are lipid genes. Um, this gene is the, the strongest, has the strongest effect on, on smoking intensity. So basically, this is a nicotine acetylcholine receptor, which basically makes the receptor uh, much more active, much more excitable by nicotine, which gives more pleasure. So of course, it, it increases intensity. And this is the well-known EPOE locus, which uh, is, of course, well-known for, for lipid levels, cholesterol levels, and Alzheimer's disease. So when, when we actually look at the genes, they look like actual disease genes. and. Um, this is just to show the, 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 the p-values we get. And then we did the replication study. And so many of them replicate nicely. This is their effects in terms of month, months. So you see that, um, well, actually, the largest effect is about seven months. The EPOE itself is, is almost five months decrease. Uh, so you can see the effect of these individual variants are, are, are very, very small. 
just a few months change in life. Now, what happens is that if you look at these 16 markers that are lifespan associated, you can see that actually because of the priors were informed by the diseases, we look back again. Now let's let's check whether how much it's really just do we rediscover diseases? And actually for the majority, disappointingly, that's what happens. So uh, when you see the um, the bottom one, this is the one with the largest effect. This is the APOE SNP that has that's the huge LDL effect. Actually, we didn't use Alzheimer's disease as as, a, as prior. Yes, somebody is interested in the SNP. Um, and then the, the, this is the second one is a is a smoking SNP. So this is the the CHRNA three and five. Um, then you have other cholesterol SNPs, uh, you've got triglyceride ones, HDL ones. Uh, so these are extending lifespan, these are decreasing lifespan. So you can see if you increase HDL levels, that increases lifespan. Uh, and if a SNP is decreasing tri triglyceride levels, it's also increasing lifespan. So anytime you see a very darkish color, it means it has been already discovered really by, by GWAS or coronary artery disease. Of course, if, if you increase your chance for coronary artery disease, it will decrease your lifespan. And there are very few uh, examples. There are some here um, where you can see generally uh, relatively mild levels, but cumulatively. So the, none of, for example, this SNP is not discovered by any of these traits, but it has a mild impact on each of these. And cumulatively, that leads to uh, increased lifespan. Uh, so, and, and of course, that's the criticism we can have is that once, since we use these priors, we really tend to pick up uh, SNPs that are, are exerting their effect on longevity via modulating these risk factors. If we don't use them, we don't discover anything else either. What's interesting, what we can also did is that you can take the difference between what's expected because of these traits and what is ex what you see with lifespan as an effect. And what, wherever you see a discrepancy, it means, ah, there's a, some excess effect, which is not explained by these traits. And always we see some excess effect. For example, very strikingly for the APOE variant, we see an excess effect, but because we didn't consider Alzheimer's disease here as, a, as an exposure trait, and had we considered probably that would have been also explaining far more of the effect on, on longevity. That's a very particular one because uh, this nipple gives you uh, heart disease, on an early, relatively earlier age, so up to 70 and beyond 70, it, it hits you again because then it gives you Alzheimer's disease, which also uh, is expected to shorten your lifespan. Uh, so um, when we look at these discrepancies, we don't uh, see very much convincing extra effect on lifespan. So, so far, it seems that the majority of lifespan might be just explained by, by these risk factors. What is very interesting to look at is, as a confirmation, is that if you look at the age effect of the course, in, in every cohort, if you look at old people, they are generally much, much healthier genetically than young people. So, for example, if you have a, a bad variant, which decreases your lifespan, and it has a 30% frequency in a young population, uh, if you carry that bad variant, then you're much more likely to be dead earlier. So, when you look at the cohort, uh, that, that's up part of the cohort, the stratum of the cohort, who are above 70, and they're still alive, they, of course, they will carry less of this variant because those people who are either dead or unfit to come to the study and participate, they will be eliminated from this. And because of that, it will increase the frequency of a lifespan extending alleles. So actually, if you just correlate age of participants with the allele frequency, uh, we can also pick up such variants. And, and very strikingly, these, these 16 variants that we discovered, their effect on lifespan very nicely is concordant with their effect on the simply the participant age. We also looked at uh, then in mice, um, and we could, we could identify a gene, which was very interesting. This gene, um, if you look at just the 72-day-old mice, and you measure this expression in the prefrontal cortex, it's a very good predictor how long the mice will live. And the, the higher the expression, the shorter they will live. And this is one of the locus that we pick up. And, and we, we also can link it using expression QTL data to the, to the discoveries we made in the genetic markers. So some of these effects are probably modulating gene expression, and some of these seems to be uh, impacting uh, brain. Good. So in summary, we used uh, 
this uh, Bayesian approach to build informative priors in order to boost the genetic discoveries. And also, they are very useful uh, on the other end also to understand uh, genome-wide association results. Because if you just run a standard GWAS and you run and you build your Bayesian prior and you see discrepancies between the two, then you can be uh, it can give you new research directions to, to understand what those discrepancy might be coming from. So it, it might have some additional extra direct genetic effects on, on a given trait. So these kind of Bayesian approaches cannot be, the priors are, are interesting because they boost discovery, but the priors are also interesting because you can distinguish between direct and indirect genetic effects. And that, that's a super interesting topic uh, of, of how you can partition basically a heritability of the trait into a direct heritability and a mediated heritability. Good, that's all I wanted to say uh, for this part. And I would like to thank collaborators uh, from different parts of um, Lausanne and, uh, and Europe. And, and uh, the, the lifespan study was spearheaded by a former postdoc in my group, Aaron. I stop here for the first presentation and I think we'd have some questions. I see Lenore, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, for me again. Um, in the first part of your presentation, you talked a lot about um, BMI, and then also you have this other measure, weight to height ratio adjusted by BMI. And I seem to recall that you have done some work on these different ways of um, assessing obesity and um, what are good measures and what are not so good measures. Could you just talk a little bit about that? How useful is it to use BMI? What exactly is this WHR adjusted by BMI and advantages and disadvantages of how to actually mm. have a, a measure for, that is a proxy for obesity or adiposity or over, overweight mm. or whatever? So it's, um... Yeah, it has been a quite a bit of disappointment in, in my career so far when I looked at, okay, BMI is such a stupid measure because, of course, it doesn't distinguish between bone density, uh, between muscles, water mass, uh, lean or, or fat mass, nothing. So uh, so it's such a stupid measure, but it's available in enormously large samples. So that's why people were very enthusiastic and using it in genetics and discovering genetic bases. Uh, while its genetic is disappointingly little, so maybe 30%, so our current estimates are more likely around 30% in terms of heritability. When we look at other measures, such as a body shape, so waist ratio is an interesting measure because it, it basically tells you where the fat is stored. So it's a slightly orthogonal measure. It is a correlation of about 0.5 with BMI. Uh, so partially sharing things, but partially giving orthogonal information uh, especially in women, the correlation is even higher. It, it really tells you whether the fat is more on the belly as, as opposed to on the hips. Uh, the hip fat itself is mostly subcutaneous fat, uh, and that's what's often referred to as metabolically healthy obesity. So if you have that kind of excess fat, which of course you don't necessarily know because waste pressure is just a very imperfect measure of that, you need to have a full DEXA body scan in order to really know your body fat percentage and then to, to, to the, the, the location of the fat itself to be able to tell more it's, if it's um, internal organ related fat or, or it's subcutaneous. So the visceral fat is really the bad fat uh, and, and the, the, the subcutaneous one, which is captured by this waste pressure adjusted BMI is, 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 is expected to be this metabolically healthy obesity. Uh, what we did, but when you correlate BMI with, with very sophisticated measures of obesity, um, such as really body fat percentage, arm fat, leg fat, trunk fat, and so on and so forth, uh, the correlation is super high. It's about 70% for almost any of these traits. So it's still a very, it's capturing very well. And then the GWAS have been run on different, let's say lean mass versus BMI, it barely discovers anything new. It's basically whatever is BMI increasing, it, it's lean mass decreasing, you know, in terms of relative lean mass. Uh, so, if then the next step, what we did is, is then you can add many, many other different traits. So when we add all these sophisticated traits, which are now available in, in, in also in hundreds of thousands of samples in the UK Biobank, you can see uh, four major obesity groups. 
And so the, the first group is general size increase. So just because somebody has increased BMI, it can be for different reasons. Um, the increased BMI can be general increased size because BMI is, is such a bad measure that it's if you're taller, your BMI seems to be um, is, 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 is badly corrected and you, you seem heavier or are basically fatter, although just because of the height. Uh, so the first group of, if you take all these kind of obesity measures together and we just do a clustering, based on genetics or non-genetic factors, there's a basically increased height, increased uh, body mass, uh, but not really necessarily increased fat percentage. The second orthogonal component is, a, um, is really shorter stature with more fat percentage. And that's really the worst kind of obesity, and that's not the sub subcutaneous fat. And then the third component is the fat distribution. So it's basically whether the fat uh, on the waist and the hip, or what's the proportion of the two of them. And that's where the more on the hip, the better, especially for women. Um, and, and the fourth component was, was a little bit the opposite, the shorter stature and, and more leanness uh, combination. And these are all orthogonal. And, and what we've seen is that uh, this subcutaneous fat has a beneficial effect on a couple of other traits, while uh, most of the other uh, fat types uh, or, or, or fat subclassifications uh, have variable effects. So the second type had the large, the worst effect on, on all cardiometabolic traits. And the first kind, uh, which is just generally coupled with larger body size as well, and not necessarily with fat percentage, uh, which is actually, that explains most of the variation and that impacts a lot of people. Uh, it, it, it has a bad a detrimental effect, but by far not as strong as the second group, which is about 20%. I just wait one more minute because maybe it's still digesting some information. Anyway, if you have some more questions, just put in the chat and uh, we can discuss that also uh, during or after my second presentation. All good? Everybody is ready to hear something different? Then I try to find my slides. All right, I assume you can see everything now. Okay, so this one I a little bit alluded to the fact that we use a lot of this so called empirical based approach when we put a prior on something such as the SNP effect sizes but we don't use it necessarily. So we don't put a prior with a fixed variance, but we put the prior in order to estimate the variance of the prior from the data. And I will now uh, show you how we can uh, put this further and how we can apply generally this kind of uh, Bayesian approaches uh, to structural equation modeling. Because so far, all I told you about was mostly a SNP effect on a given trait, but now we'll move to SNP effects on two different traits and how we can model this. Okay, so I will have a very short introduction on correlation versus causation. So when you see this image and you see this person pushing this truck and actually the truck is moving, uh, so you might correlate that this person is pushing it and the truck is moving at the same time. So the two things are correlated. But actually what happens is that there is another set of people who are pushing this truck. And actually, these are the cause for the truck moving. But this is just a correlate. While they all happen at the same time, and they all happen at the same time because maybe somebody shouts to push, and then there's just somebody stupid or funny enough to do it there. Uh, so that's, in a nutshell, what differs correlation and causality. So when correlation happens between two entities, the event of pushing something and the truck is, truck is moving, uh, it does not mean that if this person stops pushing, the truck will stop moving. While when there is causality, it most often implies also correlation. There are rare examples where it doesn't, but most often it also, of course, implies up towards correlation. And But it, the key difference here is that if this person stops pushing, the truck will stop. And if the person starts pushing, the, st 
will move. So intervening on this factor, which is causal for the outcome, is very important. And of course, it's a stupid example, but if you think about now medical applications, you can imagine that what we want is to apply some intervention of a risk factor or to modulate an outcome and to improve health outcomes. Another example of correlation, which is again not causation, is when you look at chocolate consumption per capita per country on the x-axis and a Nobel Prize winners per, cap per, per 10 million population of a country. Yeah, Switzerland is stopping both categories. Uh, correlation is extremely strong. But of course, um, eating chocolate doesn't make you smarter. It doesn't make a nation to be a Nobel Prize. Uh, country, uh, what happens really is that there is a there's a confounding factor. So confounding factors are, in, in this case, it's, it's the GDP of a country. So the higher the GDP, the more the country can invest and the higher percentage the country can invest into, uh, into research. And uh, that simply translates into better quality research and eventually a few lucky ones, like Jacques de Boucher, for example, uh, Nobel Prizes, but also the GDP, improved GDP, allows people to spend higher fraction of their salary on luxury products such as chocolate, and that increases and boosts chocolate consumption. Um, and because of this, the two have nothing to do with each other in terms of causality, but since there is a very strong confounding factor, it impacts both of them. And we love to draw, draw this kind of deck. So it's directly acyclic graphs, but it's not really acyclic because this one has a cycle. But in general, we like to draw these graphs that are connecting. It, it really helps us to understand many relationships in general in, 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 in medical genetics or, or, or in, in, uh, in human genetics. So uh, when we look at BMI and diabetes, there's a causal effect here. Uh, and uh, these graphs very nicely described. There's, Ba practically barely any confounding factor which relates. So essentially the correlation is almost the same as the causal effect. Physical activity and BMI, the higher the physical activity is, of course, it reduces BMI. But if you have higher BMI, you're less likely to do more vigorous physical activity. So there is also a feedback loop here. Uh, BMI and education, that's a very tricky question. Uh, clearly higher education, we have solid evidence, de decreases BMI. Uh, there is some marginal effect remaining probably. There is maybe some small effect of, of uh, lower BMI uh, leads to higher education, rather higher BMI leads to lower education, very, very mildly. Uh, and it's still contested, uh, but there's a very key factor such as socioeconomic status, which is impacting both of them. Okay, so you can, these graphs can be very, very complicated. And this is the central question what we have is if I want to estimate the causal effect of a risk factor and outcome, why there are confounders, it can be very tricky. You can use Mendelian randomization to tackle this. And it's it's a little bit alluded to before. And this is a causal inference technique, where, for example, if I want to estimate the causal effect of obesity on diabetes, I can use genetic markers as instruments. So you might have heard about randomized control trials where they want where the aim is to create two groups. And these two groups, one will be an exposure group, uh, and the other one will be a control group. And let's say you apply treatment. Uh, while one will be just taking placebo tablets, the other will be taking the real tablet, and then you, you create two groups and you need to follow them up for some time, depending on the, the effect, what you're looking at. And then if you see a difference in the two groups, then you're pretty sure that it's because of the treatment. Now, what we do here is very similar to that. We split the population into two groups. If you remember for obesity, I talked about this FTO allele. This FTO allele is, if you carry an extra A allele, uh, it increases your weight by two kilos. If you carry two, then it increases by four kilos. So what happens now if I take the two groups here now? One group which is, carries zero ALA, so it's a TT group, and I take the AA group. I, I'm contrasting these two groups. So this is like a randomized control trial. These people were born with these alleles. From birth, they're carrying these alleles, which from birth, they're changing the expression level of some RSX3 and 5 genes in the region, and in turn, they lead to different uh, weight. But that we already know that it leads to different weight. Now the question is diabetes. So if I'm asking now what's different in diabetes prevalence in the two groups, it's a two group where essentially we did an intervention. Of course, it's not we, but nature played lottery and intervened and gave some people ALEs and some people TLEs. And then this happened randomly in the population. And now we're looking at these two groups. So basically they had this obesity intervention from birth and now we just look at these people at 50 or 60 and ask what is the diabetes prevalence. And if they're different, 
then we can estimate, then, then we can say, ah, yeah, there is a true cause of effect of obesity on diabetes, and we can estimate the effect in a relatively simple way. If we know the effect of the genetic marker on the exposure, and we know the genetic effect uh, on the outcome, and if this genetic marker only impacts the outcome through the exposure, so through obesity, and there's no other arrow going through some confounder or some independent effect, then the total effect from the genetic marker to the outcome should be the product of the genetic effect on the exposure times the causal effect. You remember very much it's, this was exactly this prior effect. If you remember from the first, uh, the, the Bayesian prior uh, derivation. So th these are the total effects is the product of these two effects. Uh, so it's very good because from genome-wide association scans, we know for tens of thousands of traits and tens of millions of variants, what is their effect of the SNPs on the variants, on, on the different diseases and outcomes. So if I have a diabetes GWAS and I have an, a BMI GWAS, all I need to do is to take the effect size on the diabetes divided by the effect size on BMI, and I will get the causal effect. Of course, it's very noisy, and, and it has very many problems that, of course, that can be related to confounding. So, for example, when we do BMI on education, social economic status, a confounder, social economic status has genetic basis, and so that, that's, that, that's bad. But if I take now many, many different genetic markers, they will be all providing me with a different causal effect, and each of these causal effects will be a little bit biased. So if I take SNP1, like the, I take now an FTO, LE, FTO variant, which is BMI increasing variant, uh, it will give me a causal effect estimate just by the ratio of the two, of the effect on diabetes divided by effect on BMI. And I take another, I take an MC4R variant, which is also a BMI SNP, and I, that will give me another estimate for the causal effect and so on and so forth. I can do it for hundreds of SNPs, which are associated with BMI. Each of them will give me an estimator and be the standard error. And, then you can look at these different estimators and then you can choose your favorite way of summarizing them. You can take the median, the mean, the mode, and each of these correspond to a Mendelian randomization method. Okay, so it's very nice because each of these can be biased in, in its own way, but on average, they probably these biases average out and, and cancel out. So this is what happens when I do actually really BMI on diabetes that I take now, this is the FTO variant. Each dot is a SNP here. On the x-axis I'm showing what's the effect of this SNP on the exposures on the BMI. And the y-axis I check what's the effect on diabetes. And I now to take the second one, a second SNP, and that also gives me an other pair of associations. And basically, if you're just fitting linear regression line through this cloud of points, uh, then that, give me, that will give me an estimator for the causal effect, which will not take into account every single so-called instrument that I used. So it's basically splitting population first by FTO allele, then I can resplit the same population by an MC4R allele, then I can resplit re the population by, by another allele, which is obesity related, SH2B1, let's say, so on and so forth. And each of these different splits will give me different prevalence differences in terms of diabetes, and that leads to different estimates of causal effects. And then just by fitting this regression line tells me the overall causal effect estimate. Okay, but real life is more complicated and there are, there are violations all the time. So here, the genetic marker influences my exposure and the, it has an effect, this exposure on the outcome, but the outcome can also have a reverse causal effect, which is not included at all in the, all the framework that I just talked to you about. Then you can have confounding factors, such as when you remember BMI on education, the socioeconomic status is a confounding factor, which will have an effect both on X and Y. I know there are a couple of, there are many notations on this slide. Just keep in mind that A is, is the key and B, A is the forward causal effect, B is the reverse causal effect. All the rest is some sort of nuisance parameter. So the genetic markers have an effect on the exposure. So these are the direct effects, but it can have indirect effect, which X through the confounder and then gets to X. And then it can have direct effects on the outcome. Okay, so these are the, all the red arrows are the violations of the classical assumptions. And now what we want to do is, of course, not just to use one SNP, but to use many SNPs. So we'll build, actually, G here will be the full genome. So for every single SNP, we will try to, in theory, it, we could estimate its direct effect, its indirect effect, but the problem is that U is unobserved. So what we can do is we look at the whole genome and we 
uh, include some priors. And these are called spike and slap priors. So this is the effect size distributions of the different genetic markers on the exposure. And so this is a work which has been done uh, by Lisa and Nino, a very nice collaboration. Um, and so this is the framework where the gammas are random effects and they come from a spike and slab distribution. And I, I will show you just right now here what it really means. So what we believe in very, very much is that the majority of the SNPs have zero effect. I, I just didn't put the full spike of really just on zero so that you, otherwise you can't see it. So really there would be, let's say 90% of the genome uh, has no effect on traits. And maybe the 10% of the genome has some effect, and that effect comes from normal distribution. And th this has been empirically shown and, and seen that this is very reasonable. For different traits, for example, of height, we expect about 5% of the genome to be, to be related to height, and about 95% should have zero effect. For BMI, it's more like 10% of the genome. It's more polygenic uh, impacting BMI, and the remaining 90% has no effect whatsoever. So the, the actual effects of SNPs are coming from this spike and slip distribution. And so this is a mixture of two Gaussians. So actually, this is how it looks like. It still very much looks like just a spike, but you can see that there is still some bump there. Okay, so that's the assumption that we use these prior distributions here. And But again, we don't want to re-estimate these effects, especially because we don't even know what U is and we don't know what the effect of U, uh, the, the, the genotypes on some unknown confounder. So our, our structure equation model is as follows. So we have X, the exposure is determined by U, which is the confounding factor times the effect of that confounding factor on the exposure, the effect of the confounding factor on the outcome. There are bidirectional causal effects. So Y is impacting X and also X is impacting Y. It's, to be honest, it's a very difficult uh, to grasp what it really means, because it's if if x is increasing y, then y increases x, and it goes infinitely. So essentially, it's the same thing as, as applying an infinite loop here, and and seeing how what the system converges. So while people in general don't like cyclic graphs, is because this, the cycle really happens if you think about it temporarily. So if you have higher BMI, that increases your chance to develop diabetes, but if you develop diabetes, that then you tend to go to the doctor. The doctor then tell you to, uh, to lose weight. So it will have a positive forward effect and it will have a negative feedback loop. But these are only if you look across time. So initially it will increase your diabetes, your BMI, but then in turn at a later time point, your real BMI will go down. So this is not a static network really, but this is, you should imagine it across time how it's happening. And we are just looking at the convergence where it converges to, so at the, at the steady state. Then there is the extra genetic effects. So these are the direct genetic effects from G to X, which act here. Plus there is all the rest, which is uh, unexplained by, by these three components. Y is the same. You can look at that the confounder has an effect on Y, then the X has an effect on Y, and the genetics have some direct effect on Y. And the confounder itself, it has its own genetic basis. So it will be the genotype times their effect plus the, the respective error. Uh, what's nice is that we can eliminate uh, the U and uh, just directly express X and Y uh, from this with some algebraic tricks. And it, everything now will depend on just the genetic effect because that's what really ca we care about. What are the genetic effects? And then we will have a different error terms. So previously it was E and now it's epsilon. So it's really not the same error because this error includes now environmental uh, contributions. Okay, so. The thing now that if you get these equations, you can calculate the genetic association. So the genetic association is like, I take a SNP K, so it's a genetic marker K, and I regress it onto X. And if everything has been standardized, that genotypes have zero mean unit variance, the both X and Y have zero mean unit variance, the linear regression, it's a universal linear regression, it's as simple as that. It's simply just a, a product of the transpose vector times the, the vector itself. So this will be the this marginal association. So it's really nothing else than the than the correlation between the genotype and X. And this would be the correlation between genotype and Y. And these are the, the, the really the marginal effects. And that's we have access to. That's available for, as I mentioned, for tens of thousands of traits and for tens of millions of markers. So this is really good because we have we have access to this data on very large scale. 
And how to get from here to the effects is simply we need to multiply by this GK transpose, the full equation. So if I multiply this everywhere, then what's key here, what's happening is that there will be this GK transpose times G times gamma. And the GK transpose times G is the local correlation. It's basically the correlation between SNP K and all the other SNPs. And if the SNPs are too far, the correlation will be zero. So it's really just the local correlation. If you heard about LD score regression, it's, it's related to that. So it's the local correlation here. And these are the multivariable effects which are coming from spike and slab distributions. And in the interest of time, I will uh, skip a few points, but really this local correlation just really telling you how close by SNPs are correlated to each other. And now these marginal effects that we have available, so for SNP K on trait X and SNP K on trait Y, can now take the, it takes this form where these Zs are essentially local correlation times a spike and slab distribution. And where all the remaining errors are, are just depending on sample overlap and, and phenotypic correlation between the traits and sample size. Okay, so it's very nice because then we model something which is easily available and accessible and there's no privacy issue. We don't need to have actual access to genetic data. Uh, then we can model this spike and slab. Uh, th th this is pretty complicated, but we can derive the distribution of, of such a weighted sum of a spike and slab distribution. Uh, we do it through uh, Fourier transformation. I, I will skip some of the details. Basically, the local genetic correlation, this is for real data that looks like this. And if you look at the histogram of local genetic correlation, it's very much also like a spike. And it's basically, it's a mixture of two Gaussian distributions. So it will be a product of two, essentially. Uh, th this is a mix of two Gaussians. This is also a mix of two Gaussians. And you take the product of those and you sum it up. So you can imagine that this becomes a pretty complicated uh, distribution and the PDF is not analytically tractable. Uh, each, every, and every term here is a, is a best second function of the second kind, the PDF of it, but, but it's, uh, it becomes super complicated. But what's nice about these uh, Bessel functions is that their um, characteristic function is very tractable. So uh, characteristic function is just a Fourier transformation of, of, the, uh, of the PDF function. So what we need to do is simply calculate, just work with the characteristic functions of these variables and then back transform it afterwards at the very end. And that's exactly what we did. Um, and eventually we derive then the, 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 the likelihood uh, function uh, of, of this data given all the parameters. So what's nice about it is that we integrated out all these parameters because we just use the prior, in the prior, it, it is only dependent on two distributions on the polygenicity and on the heritability. So what's nice about it is to imagine another way is that what we work with is the effect sizes of millions of SNPs on the exposure and on the outcome. And that's how it looks in a theoretical scenario. There will be uh, some SNPs which will have no impact whatsoever uh, on, on, on the exposure, maybe just some part of the outcome. And there will be some SNPs which are related to the confounder, so which have a direct effect on the confounder and an indirect effect on the exposure. Those will give rise to one slope here, and those that have a direct effect only to the exposure, they will have a different slope here. So basically, and there will be a third slope which will have a direct effect on the outcome, they would have an inverse of this alpha reverse causal effect slope. So in reality, you really observe a confounder slope, a causal effect slope, and the inverse uh, of the reverse causal effect slope, and plus there will be the null set of SNPs which are not related to anything. So th this is actually what we try to model our real aim is to get these slopes estimated from the data in a rather convoluted way. So in simulations, we've shown that in, in such uh, situations, what's nice is that we can estimate the heritability of traits, the direct heritability. We can estimate the confounder, how strongly it's confounded and how strong is this genetically heritable confounder is, and we can estimate the causal effects. So it's all very good. We can reverse causal effect and forward causal effect. This is the true value is in blue. And these are the simulated values, and these are just different methods. And you can see that most of the methods can't recover the true value. Uh, 
when you simulate data under the null, we, see, we want to see a null zero causal effect, and then most uh, methods are, are biased because of the confounding. Once you have a con heritable confounding factor, essentially almost all methods will be biased. Uh, if we violate it with this confounder, you can see here the real causes. So it's a non-null causal effect now, then it will be underestimated in this case if these have an opposite sign. And when you do uh, another violation, typical violation, we have a reverse causal effect, our method still works, and the others are underestimating again heavily. So that's good. Of course, we simulated the data based on our model, but we at least we can get back the parameters what we wanted. What's nice about this structure equation model and about this random effect model uh, is that you can estimate the genetic correlation between different traits, and we can recover it pretty well. And we can now understand why two traits might be genetically correlated or even correlated, even that we can estimate, is partially because there is a forward causal effect, partially because of backward causal effect, and also there's a contribution of a confounder. So these three reasons give rise to a correlation between the two traits, and we can break up now this into the three different components. When we apply it uh, to real data to get actual causal effects, we see very nice and convincing results. For example, if you have higher BMI, it increases systolic blood pressure. If you have higher LDL levels, you will have more likely to develop coronary artery disease. Higher BMI is, of course, leading to higher diabetes. And uh, smoking is increasing your chances to have myocardial infarction. But what's very nice is also we see how education has beneficial effect to reducing coronary artery disease, diabetes. Uh, if you are more educated, you're less likely to smoke as well. It tends to even increase HDL levels and so on. So it's all very much in line with what has been uh, medically uh, established so far. What's very nice is that we can also get a uh, the confounders, because that's what people ignore so far. Like we want to see the causal effect, but what uh, can we get the confounders right? And when we do, for example, birth weight and type 2 diabetes, most methods, they claim that there is a causal effect from birth weight to type 2 diabetes. Uh, we, we don't see any significant effect, so it's just an estimator, but it's compatible with zero. But our model claims that there must be some confounder, and our model says that our confounder has to have the same effect uh, sign on both. And when we look at potential confounders, so now we actually scan through traits and we estimate their causal effects on each of these factors, we get a couple of good estimates, uh, and, and what they converge on is that probably parental obesity might be a reasonable confounding factor. So our model, it, it treats the confounder as a latent variable, and it still can estimate uh, the ratio of the, the effects of this confounder, but can't, of course, tell us what the confounder is because we just only use data for these two traits, so it's, it can't inform us about something else, but it, it, it tells us the suspicion that the data tells us that it cannot be explained by just causal effects here, there must be a confounder. And it tells us that actually there's no causal effect, it must be a confounder only. And uh, that confounder is compatible with, with parental uh, obesity. Uh, HDL and systolic blood pressure, uh, higher HDL is reducing systolic blood pressure because the beneficial effect of, of the good lipids, but it also claims that there must be a, um, a confounder, and uh, there had been a recent study claiming that might be alcohol uh, consumption is a, uh, a confounder which is positively impacting, increasing both of those. And of course, there are many other traits where we suspect there is a confounder, but we don't yet know what it is. Good. So I think with this, I'll stop, and there will be still a few minutes left for questions before the lunch break. And of course, I would like to thank very much Lisa and Nino who were spearing were really key for this project to to succeed <laughs>